Well, here I am again, back in the workshop, ready to do more jobs on the Jeep. And I've got some boxes to tick and some jobs to do, and I've got to stay positive. But if you look under the vehicle, you will see an unusually colored object mounted to the top of the differential. I've gone for like a sort of sponsored by McDonald's theme under there. You've got ketchup lowers, French fry uppers, I just have to think of some other stuff really, maybe the golden arches on the sump, something like that. But I do have a thank you to say, and I think his name's called Phoenix2Math. It was a subscriber, I think he was anyway. He commented on the last video and he said, look, the engagement on that bushing looks kind of weird. It's pinching, it shouldn't. And I sort of had a feeling that that was a problem, but I really just wanted to ignore it and not touch it. But I decided to pluck up the courage after his comment, take the arm out and check it all. And you're absolutely right. The way it mounted onto the bushing, it was a slightly ing correct angle and it was pinching down on the polyurethane so I actually took the arm off I cut it I re-angled it extended the lengths of the ears that go over the bushing and as you can see now it is looking a lot healthier under there apart from the color of course but today I have a bigger job to do and I'm going to take you along with me and it's going to suck ass so apart from fixing that there is gonna be this to deal with the sway bar. If you remember, I got this sway bar a while ago um, and this is from a guy called RJ in the US. He doesn't actually make these anymore. I think he just stocks parts that uh, you know people might need to fix them. But basically, if you're not aware of it, you turn that and the sway bar is completely disconnected with full suspension travel as to whatever your setup might be. But it works extremely well. And I obviously did a video of the installation and testing it. And you've seen me use it with the three link video. So it's a really good bit of kit. If you have a vehicle that does a little bit of off road stuff, some on road stuff, and you just want to get out and do that. The only thing I would say that if you were rock crawling, it's a pretty vulnerable thing. Like, if you look at that, I mean, maybe you enter something incorrectly and you strike that. I don't know whether that's the case or not. I don't rock crawl. But the problem is, is it keeps bending. If I move that shackle out of the way and you look up there, you can see that arm isn't looking too healthy, this thing here. And um, it's all kind of bent out of shape, really. I've actually bent it back, but you can kind of see the remnants of that. So mine was always a prototype. I was one of the first people to try this thing out and um, and it does work really well. But I think now he makes those arms double the thickness or he did make them double the thickness. In my case, on the axle side, if you look at the sway bar mounts I built, it's like six mil bracket with an eight mil thick piece of triangulation underneath. The weakness on mine is those arms and it purely comes down to the angle. So I've just got to decide whether I plate them on the outside or on the inside, but the major issue is this side because you have the hub and if you tee this off here you kind of really want it coming around the hub uh, the hub so there's some side walling for it to work out there we go uh, i'm trying to think of like a simple fix but there just isn't one the the, the bottom line is is the arms just aren't thick enough. Oh, mate, it's really hurting my hands. Absolutely killing me. It's like trying to control a bucking bronco by its end. Well, here it is. I've got it all apart. I thought we'd just take a look at it together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't really inspected it too well. The hymes don't seem too bad. This one's got a touch, touch of play in it. That one's pretty stiff. That one's pretty stiff. That came from my um, passenger side, basically. So where I hit a pothole, bent the sway bar link and ultimately bent that. It was an extremely bad ditch in the road. Um, I think it's obviously had a knock on effect on some other components. So in all fairness to it, you know, it's just the way it goes with these things. But yeah, I, I just need to basically make that double the thickness. So like plasma cut it out or we'll see if the guys at the machine shop can actually build it for me. I I'd prefer to just do it myself because I don't have to wait for ages. <laughs> I 
I tried to find metal to thicken these things up and I just couldn't. They just didn't really have that in stock and for them to CNC it, I would have had to wait at least four, four weeks, something like that. So it's just not really worth it. So what I've done is I'm gonna actually build them in a different way. So that one's gonna be round that way like that. And I've actually made this piece here, not made, but it's just a piece of angle and I've just cut it to shape pretty easy. And that is gonna go on there like that. The idea is that hopefully it widens the mounting positions a little bit. I think it's gonna be an epic fail. Now, now I'm home and I'm thinking about it, I'm like, what the f have I just done for the last two hours? And how did I think this would be a good idea? So here we are, here's the, the finished article. Still need to give them a really, really good clean and then um, take the flapper wheel on them a bit um, just to clean up the areas where the welds went weird. So there was this kind of etch primer that I used and I forgot I used it. It reacted really weirdly um, where I hadn't gotten rid of some of it. So you can see here you got some nice welds but things get a bit skank there. Well, these things should be dry now. Uh, obviously, they are painted another hideous colour. Probably questioning my colour choices in this video. Yeah, I think it looks okay. Um, I mean, some of the welds are hideous and, you know, there's probably going to be some corrosion because of that, but I, I just honestly don't care that much. They're just really supposed to do a job and um, they should do that. So let's put it together. Well, I put a bigger clip in. And I'm just greasing her up. That's the way it should always be. That's the beginning. I think I'm also just going to put on a little bit of sealant. That'll probably do. So this thing can go on there. But I just need to get the orientation right. But I'm going to do that in a little while. Well, there we go. And then it's time for the bearing. Just gonna apply a little bit more monkey spunk on this thing here. Oh, it looks nice in there. No corrosion. It's got a little gasket on the back, you see. And it's full of the same grease that they use on the snowmobiles. So there it is, all assembled. And you're probably thinking, wow, that looks really strong. It'll never bend. It probably won't. But as we've gathered, as we, as we get older in life, we kind of work it all out. You start to see the code coming down the screen, like in the matrix. And you sort of realize that it's just this one big ring around a rosy bullshit. This thing here, you're never fixing problems. Not really, you're never really fixing problems like this. You're just moving them around. So the problem now will be moved elsewhere. Either the hub will break or the links on the axle will break. And that's where I think they'll go. Because if you look at them, they're not being supported on either side and the bolt is too long. So the leverage will bend that piece of metal. That piece of metal has to be supported either from either end of the bolt, like I've built here, or you know, you, you essentially go back to the drawing board and you figure something else out, or it's made from like really thick metal. We'll be here again. Don't you worry. We'll be here again. And I will be re-welding something up, probably some point in the winter. But it's okay, I accept it now, I accept it. You know, this is just the way, way it is. You know, you buy shit, you paint shit, it breaks, you build stuff stronger, more metal, more weight then something else breaks because that thing's too strong now. So then you have to buy this or build that. Then you paint that again. Then you buy more primer. 
you try and buy good primer though, like Acid Etch Primer, but it doesn't, you know, maybe you bought a shit one and it didn't really work. Or you didn't clean the metal properly. So then you have to do this again and that, and then this like endless cycle, this endless cycle. But you know what, I actually enjoy it. And my wife said to me the other day, like, it's crazy how you've been working on that car almost every week for 10 years and you're still not bored of it. And I looked up at her and I said, you know why? Because it won't let me win. It's true, right? The never ending problems, the constant bullshit. I don't think I could live without it. If I had a vehicle that was perfect and it never broke, what the fuck would I do? Probably be out in the wilderness camping actually, fishing and smelling that fresh autumn air, picking mushrooms, trying to find those big mushrooms, you know, the ones that look like horse dicks, you know, because those are the ones we're all looking for, right? Soon. Soon. Anyway, let's slot this bad boy in. Okay, slippy, slidey, in goey. The bushings look pretty good. That's right. God. You can tell the bushings are good. Putting up a bit of a fight. That's right. So it doesn't actually matter what position this is in because the sway bar's unlocked, so you can always move it round later on. But I don't know whether I need to put this key in. Uh, like the woodruff key or whatever you would call it. I don't know what it's called in the States. We call it a, I don't even think it's actually a woodruff key. But um, that can go on like that. Yeah. And then you've got to slide on. Make it difficult. Get it started at least. Should be good um, but I'm totally stupid because now the arm can't get past the the steering linkages <sighs> so I've picked up some new bolts although they're not grade 8 actually that's the right one uh, they're grade dung as you can see like this is a slightly tougher bolt but I think it'll be okay for, with regards to a sway bar in fact if a bolt breaks it's probably better than bending something but the key now is to actually build some spacers with aluminium a little bit like you see here to allow the heim to have movement so you don't obviously want the heim bolted straight directly up to what it's against or it isn't actually going to have its full range of movement. Just popped a spring washer on that side. One of these little sphinx rings can go on there. This guy there, another sphinx ring, some Loctite, and a compression nut or a nylock nut just there. So the aluminium is a bit thinner than I'd like, but you can see as it travels over, it isn't actually touching the mount. I've got that little spacer through. This is so much fun. I love stuff in my eyes. <laughs> Go through the hole, happy. I'm just getting the steering dialed in in terms of like the steering stops because obviously these stick out a bit further. I wanted to check the tire contact. Now I'm using a specific measuring system for doing this and that's how many fingers I can fit in between the gap of the tire and the control arm. It's a genuine measuring system and I'll go as far to say as I've used it my entire life and it steered me in the right direction. So it's all completed um, and I'm pretty happy with it really. The whole point of it was to actually step out the mounting position. So the mounting position used to be in line with this here, now it's stepped out there. 
resulting in a straighter link, um, a stronger arm and everything else. This is on full lock, uh, so you know it's it's looking all right really. It, it's it's pretty much exactly how it was before. I've just adjusted the steering stop a little bit so that the chain isn't making contact with the control arm anymore. There's a pretty decent gap there and um, it can't really go any further than that. So uh, what I actually had to do as well was bring this in. So I cut a piece of this spacing away while it was on there and pushed it up um, to get this in further. And on the other side, I've actually cut the back part off off here so that it's slightly shorter and I've just put a butt plug on the end just to ensure nothing can get in so that's looking nice and straight too um, so yeah I, I think I think it's gonna be all right I mean when you look at the clearances it's not gonna really be a problem because as the tire goes up the arm goes with it because they're completely linked and if you drop that back there you've got a couple of fingers worth in between the control arm where you can see the chain was making love to it last winter so uh, you know I just want to avoid that this year hence sort of getting that set up so yeah chain wise as well this side you you know it's, it's glancing past you can kind of see the links there going past that nut which is the closest thing and I think it'll be all right I'll just have to test it on another note I do get asked a lot of questions about chains um, now I'll be the first one to admit I am not the person to be asking about chains. I'm not an expert on chains. I haven't tried loads of different types of them, but I think the premise with chains and, and, this, and where you use chains, um, well, let me say this, they're one of the most useful pieces of equipment you can carry in the winter, but they can also be a massive hindrance if you use them in the wrong conditions. They're, they're like night and day in the right conditions. You know, when the snow's not high enough to, to create hang-ups in the vehicle, they're absolutely amazing, um, especially on inclines where you're trying to climb. Uh, and if you leave them a little bit loose as well, which obviously you don't do at high speed, but when you're plugging through snow or mud or something, a slightly loose chain can be can be actually be pretty good as well. You know, it really depends. Like, personally, I, I really like chains, but I'm very mindful that you're taking the weight of the tire up to almost like probably a 37, you know, so it's it's a lot of weight really for the axle. Given these are so cheap, I bought two of them um, because I've had a lot of problems with this thing. Um, putting it in is a pain in the ass and my advice would be do not put it in from the front. Even though you don't want to take the timing cover off to change it, it is a nightmare. Um, and, it, and I was actually even trying them this way. Some of you pointed out in the last video that it was in backwards. It was because I've been through so many of these damn things um, with them all leaking and having problems that I just desperately tried it the wrong way around to see whether it worked. But from taking the timing cover off, I've now learned that it's better to put them in from behind. Which we can all agree sounds more plausible I know it's gonna leak because like the, the rubber got peeled away there and that 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 sealant will oh, mate I don't think that's gonna work that's so disappointing I'm gonna have to take it out and do it again with the other one that is so gutting at least that seals kind of usable So I've polished this out as best I can, um, but I've, I've just figured out what these are from, and it's from the puller, from taking the uh, harmonic balancer off. So after sanding all this down and smoothing it out, I've, I've pretty much got it looking really good. And I actually used the old seal um, on top of that seal, or the old seal, I just bought that, but the one that got ruined the first attempt, I put that on there with a flat piece of metal and then basically tapped it through.
Oh, the horror of what just happened. For those of you wondering why I just did that, there's a hole on the flywheel that you normally use a special tool for to lock it in place. You can tighten the sump up, uh, the harmonic balancer up, sorry, and I used a drill bit and it snapped. So I drilled a hole and uh, got it out. So that's all back together and I've given it 24 hours to cure just to make sure because the way that seal went in and the sealant around it, I just wanna make sure that's fully dry before I start introducing oil to the system. I've also given it a healthy coat of burger meat brown, but I'm gonna put the intercooler back on before I start this thing up because I really want it connected up to the air filter. Everything's running fine, no leaks. That's the main thing, really, no leaks. Um, so I can actually reassemble the whole engine now, but you noticed it sort of like sputtered on startup. That's actually air in the system. Now, I don't know whether it's from the filter change, um, despite pumping it out, there might've been a bit of air left in there, um, or maybe there's a leak somewhere. So it's a leak's always a bit of a pain in the ass to find out, but I guess I'll find out in due course. But let's begin putting it back together. So I'm using a slightly different type of tensioner these days. Um, this is one with the slot in it. So you can kind of manipulate or decide how tight you want the belt to be. It still has a spring at the bottom there so that you can lever it down. So it has got tension but there's just a little bit more play in what you decide you want and that's really to take tension off the pump to try and let the pumps last longer. Hopefully it works. Definitely an air leak in the fuel. was shaking its sweet ass all over the place and I think it was trying to seduce me but it's not gonna win um, I think the tension is actually just a little bit too loose and in fact I just checked the old belt and it was a million times worse which kind of leads me to think it isn't a belt problem so there's a screw on the side here that you can actually manually tighten up the pulley with um, you kind of want it just to turn a touch that and time for this guy here I've got a couple of poles sticking out under the radiator there normally they go into like rubber bushes and they go in those holes but you can see I've put some weather strip on the back of the cross member and mine actually slots in behind the cross member and that's what gives me room for my intercooler Favourite sound. <laughs> getting to the final stages of at least getting the engine running. That would be nice. So there's definitely enough space there for, for plenty of, of air to get between them, to not have heat soak, other little things to bear in mind, just stuff that can vibrate, rub. So it's going to be about 10 litres of this stuff to go into the engine. Um, and then we're going to have to bleed a, bleed a bit of it out. But I've, I've heard some interesting stuff. I'm not claiming to be an expert, by the way, but I've read some interesting stuff on the forums over the years about how to put coolant in this engine. And one of the things I've read is, uh, sorry, the, you've got to jack up the back of the vehicle so the engine's level uh, to put coolant in or you get 
or you get an air pocket in cylinder head number one and it cracks. I, I've i never done that. I've never had cylinder head number one crack. Um, and I don't, I don't even think that's physically possible. I saw, I saw someone cut open the old head and an AMC head years ago and I could never refine the thread. Um, and it showed the wall thickness difference in wall thicknesses in in the um in the head and, and and the difference was slightly thicker on the newer head but whether or not that was for all all the heads they make i don't know but i just found that quite interesting and there was a massive write-up about it as well but i never could find it again but there is nowhere in the head really for an air pocket to form and also the air pocket is probably going to be in front of the thermostat but then again you could choose a thermostat with a backflow valve like a little ball bearing and that will that will stop that so um yeah i i would uh i would <laughs> i wouldn't do that if i were you also the ethylene glycol um organic acid technology or inorganic acid technology or whatever there's loads of different cool it's silicate this is silicate based this is actually hybrid organic acid technology coolant so it's like a blend of like ethylene glycol and like organic acid technology it's like the most modern coolant you can get it's low conductivity and the point being it's designed for engines with mixed metals so aluminium heads copper and brass radiator cast iron parts steel stainless steel whatever um, that's what it's for so i would personally choose that over the old school gr green or or like the, the older blue coolant i'd use the red stuff i, I see that as well a lot i mean i mean i've seen quite a few engines basically and taken quite a few apart of this and like the blue coolant does corrode the aluminium stuff like quite quite badly over the years and you know if you're buying one of these jeeps with one of these engines in then if it hasn't been looked after it'll be it'll be the be a problem really but anyway i'm gonna put some coolant in So this upper radiator hose is basically completely empty. There is a little thing we can pull there, but I'm not going to bother with that. If you squeeze the lower radiator hose, it'll just get the air going in the system. You can see the bubbles starting to leave. Put more in. And I know I'm done because I'm left with that, which means I did a good job. Well, we're a few days on from all of that, and uh, yeah, that was that was a lot of work. I had to walk away from it because I still had problems after um, all of that. One of the injectors was absolutely pissing fuel out the back of itself where the two parts of the housing went together. Obviously, I over-tightened it. That's what I'd, I'd done. The two parts of the housing, I'd, I'd tightened them together so much they'd started to do that. Um, and fuel was firing out the back of the injector just as hard as it was firing out the front of it. It was just an, a mess. So fortunately I had another injector that I built up and tested. Put that in today and it's fine. So all the leaks are fixed now. It's running really good. The only thing that's making it sound a bit weird is the flexi on the exhaust has finally cracked and gas is pouring out of it. So sounding a bit weird there, but so that's another job. So just that and the MP231. So I've just got to get a, a rebuild kit for the MP231 and this thing's up and running again. But I think some of you are actually right and I've got to eat some humble pie. I think that the front prop shaft is too long and that's what's contributed to it killing the front output bearing on the MP231. Some of you did say that. Hands up, I said no, I think it's fine. I think you were right, it isn't. So 
I'm going to do what I did with the rear one. I'm going to actually going to cut it in half or near the end, cut it off, put it back on the vehicle, put the two halves together, use a dial gauge to make sure it's straight and weld it up again. It's basically exactly what I did with the rear and that's been running fine the last year. I'm going to do it with the front and I'll make a video on it when it comes to it. So, and it won't be a how to, because I don't recommend you do that. Really after you do that, you should be sending it off to be balanced. But if you can get it within like, sort of between two and four thousandths on the dial dial reader you know that thing's straight so my rear ones i know it's straight but it's probably not balanced but i've not noticed any vibrations yet but uh what was going to happen if all of this was rebuilt was i was going to take the roof tent off in the next video and show you the build of the bed platform i'm doing in the rear because i'm going to be sleeping in the vehicle in the winter and um i'm not going to be sleeping in the roof tent the reason being is um i'm having issues with mold and combating mold and just drying the tent off properly in the winter temperatures here range from minus one to minus 40. it can fluctuate a lot and you can get a lot of humidity up in those upper temperatures when it's minus one zero so you know you might have a load of ice in your tent um, if you're storing it outside and then that will all turn to water you know you can get some problems with mold and, and it really starts to get tricky most people who have roof tents on their trucks in this country take them off and the ones that store them outside they generally need airing pretty regularly um, in a building now if you had a garage that was really big and you could drive your vehicle in open the tent sure you could store it like that it wouldn't be a problem but the issue i'm having and where i can't get rid of moisture even if i run the diesel heater for like five hours in the tent is the taped seams so where they stitch and then they put that tape uh, to stop water ingress that's the problem so water can build up in there and it's very hard to remove even for, with running the diesel heater for ages so with, that's where the mold's basically starting on, on my tent. So uh, that, that's a word of warning for, the, for those of you who are storing tents outside. You know, you might want to think about that unless you already have experienced it or found a solution I haven't. Um, you know, it is, a, it is a bit tricky, really. So I really like that tent and I don't want it to deteriorate. And I've treated it with bleach and everything and reproofed it. And it's looking pretty good now. So it's coming off um because it's too small anyway for for the family now we'll see how it goes really but when when summer comes around and we get out as a family again we're going to do what we tested out at the end of this summer in this vehicle which was uh the awning room with the two and a half by two and a half meter awning set up and, and it worked really well now if you followed the channel for a while you would have seen me in my hammock in my ground tent and also in in the awning room um, the, the only downside really is finding an area that's suitable for the awning room. But to be honest, we never really run into that that often anyway. Yeah, in the next video, you're going to see me working on the Renix, um, the, the four litre. Going to gonna crack on with some of the work I've been doing. I've got to leave this now because I've got to try and get that rebuild kit for the MP231 and that's not going to be coming anytime soon. So on to the Renix. So for those of you who've been looking forward to seeing what I've been up to on that and completing some corrosion repair, that's the letter of the day the next time you see me. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. You probably didn't. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for uh, guys on Patreon for supporting the channel. Thanks for liking and uh, commenting and whatever else you do to support the channel. I really appreciate it. It all really helps. And I'll see you again really soon in another one. Take care, guys. Also get another hobby. Trust me.